Good afternoon. I'm Lynette Greenhaw. I'm the Vice President of Education and Workforce here at the Dallas Regional Chamber. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I know we have some people that are still signing on, but we're going to go ahead and get started with our conversation as people join us. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, the, uh, the Dallas Regional Chamber has focused on really two different things, serving our members and bringing you current useful information through our website, through our social media, and through a series of virtual programming just like this one today. We have had an ongoing series that's focused on bringing real life examples of what a responsible return to workforce looks like. We recently brought together business and nonprofit experts to share reopening best practices and experiences with our regional education leaders, those people that are working so hard to develop those safe reopening plans for our schools. We know right now there is no more hot topic, no more topic at the top of mind for our community, for our state, and for our nation that is that return to school. And that's what the gist of what we want to do today. We know that it's on the hearts and minds of our parents, our educators, and our business community. So today's program is designed to inform pre-K through elementary parents on the important issues to consider as they make those difficult decisions about what your education options are for your children this fall. So for a brief, well, for a brief welcome, I invite Amber Scanlon, Senior Vice President of Client and Community Relations of PNC Bank to join us. Amber? Thanks, Lynette, and thanks everyone for, for being here today. Um, PNC is a very proud member of the Dallas Regional Chamber, and we're also honored to serve as the chair of the Education Workforce Committee at the DRC. We are very focused on all matters related to the growth and development of our region students and our future workforce. Um, as you all know, the DRC actively advocates to strengthen our educational pipeline Everything from early childhood education to K-12 to higher education and certainly workforce training, this is all to meet the needs of our region's vast number of employers. Um, as a parent, today's issue and the topic is really important to me as well. I've got a rising fourth grader and a four-year-old who should be in pre-K right now. And many parents have all sorts of situations similar to this and these are extremely challenging times but also even more challenging decisions we have to make for the education of our children. So with that, um, all of you are certainly wrestling with, with these issues and the many considerations of returning to school this fall. Um, we're certainly thankful to the DRC for assembling this amazing panel of experts to share context and support for, for all of us and certainly for our, our broader workforce at large. So with that, let's get right into it and, and thank you all again for being with us today. Thanks, Lynette. Thank you, Amber, so much. So as Amber said, we're brought together some experts for you that we, for, th for three sort of critical topic areas, health, social and emotional impact, and virtual learning in a digital environment. And again, today we're focusing on pre-K through elementary age students. So I'm gonna introduce each one of those uh, folks as we bring them into the conversation. And we do want to tell you that we will hope we will have a time at the end to address some of your questions. So if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat function and uh, we'll be monitoring those and, and hopefully we can get to some of those as our time carries on. So first up, we have Dr. Brad Tate, Vice President and Medical Director, Enterprise Case Management from Children's Health. So Dr. Tate, um, parents are hearing so much about COVID-19 and how it either does or doesn't affect children medically. Can you please help us sort through all that information and what are you actually seeing right here in the Dallas region? Absolutely, um, we're, absolutely. We are seeing definitely an effect in children. Let's, there's a myth out there that it doesn't affect children or that it's very mild, um, which just simply isn't true. Uh, since the pandemic began in Dallas County, roughly 3,800 children under 18 have tested positive for the virus. And that accounts for nearly 10% of all cases reported between March 24th and July 17th. And the number of children with the virus more than tripled between May, uh, sorry, March and May, jumping from roughly 2% to 11% of cases for those months. So we're definitely seeing an increase in children, but not only an increase in the number, we're seeing an increase in the hospitalization. Um, since uh, early June, July, we've seen 101 children who have been hospitalized for it. And though, although children do often have mild to moderate symptoms compared to adults, especially adults with comorbid conditions, 
we don't want to fool ourselves. Children can, children can get sick. There was a 17-year-old girl in the, in the Dallas area who passed away with no medical problems um, from COVID. There's reports of children in other parts of Texas who have had no medical conditions who passed away from it. So it doesn't discriminate. Not, yes, the, those with med comorbid medical conditions are at a higher risk, but it doesn't mean that those without those medical conditions are without risk. But when you're looking at your children and thinking about going back to school, you also have to think about the health of those in the family. What are their risk factors and how does that affect them? And I had a conversation with my wife and my two children last night as we're wrestling with this decision of should our children go back to school or not? We initially, when numbers were down, we're going to send them back to school. But as the numbers are going up and I'm high risk, that we're having a serious discussion with our family and our kids about going back. So let's be clear that the numbers are increasing not just the numbers, but we're also seeing children, the number of hospitalizations increasing as well. So thank you so much for that. So what, is there a tipping point when parents are looking at that number where, where the numbers are going up or down that you can recommend that they feel some level of comfort? Or is, is it really just watching the trends all the way up and down? It's more than just watching the trends. It's, it's, and it's an individual family's decision. There's several factors that play into it. Um, as I alluded to, it's not just the risk factor, the risk, the risk of your children. They may be low risk, but for instance, in my family, I'm high risk. So that, in my, my wife and I's eyes, that puts the whole family at high risk. And so we look at the risk of the family. Um, we look at our children and, and their, their mental health well-being. For instance, if you have a child who doesn't deal well with change, for instance, in, in Frisco, if our child goes to um, in, in school learning, if there's positive cases, they may shut down the school, which means they're slip, flipping back to virtual. So there may be a lot of going back and forth. And so if you don't have a child that handles that change, well, that's something to consider when you're making that decision. So there's a number of factors that weigh into it. The parent's comfort level, if you're going to be a, uh, an overly anxious parent the whole time that your child's in school, that's going to translate and your children are going to pick up on that. So there's a lot of factors that you have to consider. And one decision for one family may not be the right decision for the next. And so it's definitely a family decision looking at multiple things. And, and there's, there's no right or wrong answer. You just have to look at what the best decision is for your family and know that, you know, there's different resources in the community that will help you throughout that decision. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. So to address another important aspect of the topic, we have Jessica Trudeau, who is the executive director of the Momentus Institute. Jess, the mental health and well-being of our children is at the forefront of parents' concerns. Mm -hmm. We are so fortunate to have the Momentous Institute right here in Dallas as a respected nationwide leader of children's social and emotional health. In your experience, how has this crisis impacted the mental and social emotional health of our young children, and how should this impact parents' decisions about school this fall? Will you please us help us sort of unpack this giant worry that everybody has about that aspect? Sure, thank you. And you know, I'll say that I'm speaking on behalf of Momentus Institute, but I'm also a mom of an 11 year old and a 13 year old. So I'm trying to walk through this myself. And I think the best thing that we can do for one another is to have empathy for all, that we're all gonna make it through this time and this situation. You know, there was an article in the newspaper this morning about, um, you know, DISD and their planning. And um, one of the quotes was that really stood out to me, there is no playbook for this. So when I'm thinking about decisions for our organization, Momentous Institute for our school, um, there's no playbook. We're going to try to make the best decisions we can based on the data and information that we have. And really what I would like to say for parents is it's the same for all of us. It's the same as parents. We're going to try to make the best decisions. Um, first, I want to say it's a personal decision for every family. And so um, every family has a different set of circumstances, and I don't believe there is any one right decision. Um, when we think about mental health, so I will offer, we also offer therapeutic services um, for more than 5,000 children and family members on an annual basis. And Lynette, to your question of how is this impacting children and families, um, there is an um, incredible amount of stress that's being placed on families, not just about the decision to go back to school, but if parents have lost jobs or have uncertainty about employment. And so we are seeing more complex uh, trauma and toxic st stress show up for the families that we're serving. 
Um, in regards to child's mental health, when it comes to the decision to go back to school, um, one of the things that I want to offer is the most important thing that we can do as parents is to have an open line of communication with our children. Um, and so sometimes that means having the conversation for the 25th time um, and, and understanding that for children, just as adults, um, I have walked through many conversations with my friends just to help me process how to think through decision making. Um, that is both to come to an answer, but also to manage stress and anxiety and children are the same way. So even if it is the 25th time you're having the conversation, every time they are learning to manage their anxiety by having that conversation with you. Now we're talking about pre-K through elementary conversations and so those could look different. And so what I would offer is maintaining an open line of conversation in whatever form it shows up in. So it could show up as conversations, it could show up as phone calls and texts, it could show up as drawings for the youngest of children. And there are some questions that parents can utilize in order to support that discussion. So, you know, when there's some new bit of information that comes out. So a few weeks ago, my particular school district, Lewis, Louisville Independent School District said, OK, you have two weeks to decide. And so um, an example of how I engaged my children was, you know, I asked my daughter, who is on the more anxious side, um, I asked her, when you hear this, what comes up for you? Right. Um, or you can ask um, ask your children to walk through given two different circumstances. What are the feelings and what happens in their body? Right. So if their stomach clenches and they get anxious saying we can talk through this and walk through this together. We say at Momentous Institute for Teachers and Parents and it's been said to me personally in raising my children for the most part, your children are going to do as well as you. Now there are outside, there are you know, external circumstances, there are very many variables in terms of what our children's outcomes will be, but they're gonna look to parent or guardian to see how are you coping with this, and they're gonna take, follow suit. Um, so I wanna, you know, that's a little bit about children's mental health. I do wanna say, you know, and in regards to how we take care of ourselves, it's very important that parents are aware of where their anxiety level is mm -hmm. and that they're taking care of themselves and finding ways to brainstorm what they're gonna do that is outside of the conversation with children. For example, if a child is highly stressed and a parent thinks this is really overblown and not a big deal, that shows up as a lack of attunement with that child. Um, and it's not going to be comforting for the child. And then the inverse, um, if a child is not as anxious and a parent is highly anxious, the child can feel that the parent is imposing that anxiety onto them. So what I would recommend is whether it's with a professional or whether it's a friend or family member or your, your partner, being able to have those conversations so that when you're showing up with your child, you're showing up in a way that really is telling them I honor where you're at and I honor your thoughts and feelings on this and we're, you know, we're gonna work through this together. Um, there's a couple really concrete things that parents can do either way to help prepare those ch their children. Um, the first is in particular, if your child's going back into in-person classroom, to have days where you're practicing what that's gonna look like because that's gonna um, help to reduce their anxiety. And so that could be a day where a child is wearing a mask all day at home. Um, a, you know, having the child practice in between things using antiseptic and just thinking about what, what they're gonna need to do to ensure their safety throughout the day. Um, you know, so that it's not just on the teachers, the child is also taking that agency. Um, and then, you know, Momentous Institute, we, we do a lot of work around mindfulness and breathing practices in order to help equip children with the resources they need to manage difficult emotions. And so, um, for example, at Momentous School, we have three times a day in every classroom where students do deep breathing exercises. And the idea behind that is that you are building that muscle and practicing when you are not in an emergency 
so that when a child is feeling like they're having an anxiety attack or they go into an emergent situation, they can say, oh yes, I have my breath. I know what I can do for myself to calm down in this moment. So, you know, we recommend in the weeks coming up to school that particularly if you have a child that is highly anxious, that you are practicing um, some of those uh, calming mechanisms and breathing strategies to help equip that child to be able to walk through the day. And then the final thing I would offer, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm being a little long-winded. No, but I no you're great. <laughs> no, keep um, going. You're doing great. So I would say, you know, another thing, like I said, we have a school, we provide training based on what we learn at the school, but our longest for, for almost a hundred years, our work has been exclusively in the provision of mental health services. So I wanted to offer what you can be looking out for um, to be able to gauge if your child needs some extra support. And it, it, you know, these are really basic things, but if your child has a significant shift in mood, sleeping or eating that lasts continuously for one to two weeks, definitely for two weeks, that's when either that child needs some more intensive interaction and support from parents or may need to talk to a professional to try to assess what's going on. That's a great indicator for, for any, any new situation for a child. It's gonna take them time to adjust but two weeks is a good marker for if they aren't adjusting. Um, and we really wanna lean in, whether it's professional help or whether it's the family rallying around this child to understand what it is that they need to feel safe um, and be able to feel safe enough to have the conversation in the future. I think I'm looking down at my notes because I tried to think of just me as a parent, what would be helpful, sure. what I wanna hear. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions later, but I think those are the main things that I wanted to offer. Great. Thank you. Those are, those are such good tips and we'll have time to come back. So if you think of something else you want to offer, we'll come, we'll come back to you. So let's bring in um, Lori Lynch, who is the senior, senior vice president of customer service at iStation. iStation is a, provides an e-learning program that is utilized by many school districts in the Dallas region. So Lori, technology is such a critical aspect of learning in this virtual and this digital environment. What should parents be aware of when it comes to digital learning? And how can parents have confidence that their students will advance academically in this remote digital environment? Well, thank you, those are, those are great questions. And, and thank you guys for having me. Um, having, having been at iStation now for 15 years and been in the education space, uh, for about 26 years. Uh, I was a former pre-K teacher and kindergarten teacher. And so a lot of the things that have been shared so far about the social and emotional learning and being respectful of each child's differences is so important. And that's something that in educational technology, you have to also be considerate of as well. And that means that not all students are going to respond well to technology in the home environment day in, day out. And so it's all about balance. And I think that's something that that we particularly at iStation have always promoted is to have a balance of digital experiences, a balance of teacher experiences, bringing the parent and the educator back into the conversation in the circle, and also finding ways to extend technology beyond just being in front of a screen. So are there ways to uh, do what some teachers are calling flip classroom or um, dual home and language learning where uh, teachers are able to create learning modules for them and then have uh, the, the instruction be done in the home environment and then the teacher then facilitate the learning after they have viewed that module. So what we've been doing is really finding ways to extend what we do in the ed tech space to make sure that we're meeting the needs of various types of people because technology isn't easily readily available to every single family. And that's another big concern as you go to this remote learning. And what about our families who are in rural areas who don't have access to Wi-Fi, uh, who may not have an iPad in the home environment or a Chromebook or a laptop or anything like that? Uh, that's been a big challenge since March. And we you know, really had to work with families to pivot and find ways to communicate with them beyond just being on iStation. What ways could we extend our learning to podcasts, YouTube videos, how to things with just lessons that can be printable that parents can view on their smartphone versus having 
the laptop or the iPad or the, or the latest Chromebook or things like that. So really being conscientious about that. Also differentiating the instruction, making sure that what parents are looking at and what their schools may be using are going to give them a differentiated experience. That it's going to meet the learner, not only at their own ability, but to move and adapt with them. And that the ability to scaffold that learning is going to support them as the learner no matter where they are, even if they're a year behind or two years behind. We know that the summer slide is real, has been for years, now we have the COVID slide. And so it's a very fearful time of students losing that learning ability. So again, looking for things in the ed tech space that are very differentiated and can meet those students at various levels. Um, I myself am not a parent I did not get the privilege of being a parent, but I do have some colleagues here with me that have, have struggled and they're listening in today uh, with what to do about this. I have a colleague just the other day I was speaking with and they thought their school district was going back face to face. And then as everything has changed in the last few weeks, um, their two sons just broke down in tears and their third graders, yeah, third and a sixth grader. And they miss their friends. They miss their friends desperately. And it's been very hard on the social and emotional side for children. And that's something that we try to address at iStation as well in our learning path is to support social and emotional learning. Uh, we have a huge cadre of specialists who are very adept in early childhood and social and emotional learning who have developed podcasts and, and blogs about how uh, we can support that and continue to put a focus on that because this is Yes, it's important to continue the learning, but it's also important to make sure that they're ready to receive the learning and that they're emotionally ready to deal with what's happening around the pandemic. So, um, you know, I, I think that, again, with a parent's concern with what they're choosing in the ed tech space, just focus on what can differentiate that makes sure that the student is getting what they need at their individual level, not just what they need at the grade level. Um, the grade level is important. We know we have standards to teach to, but making sure that we're differentiating on the ability of the child, not just what the standard says I need to master at this time. And that's something that we focus a lot on is really making it about individualization and also bringing in a lot of choice. Uh, when students have more choice and uh, autonomy in what they're using, they feel more empowered. And, and that's something that we try to focus on too. Thank you. Those are, are great tips. So we have a, a follow-up question for you, Lori. You mentioned that COVID slide. Um, it is a concern that not only parents have, but certainly even we at the Dallas Regional Chamber as, as we work to really advocate and prepare our workforce moving forward. So how can we really assess what student progress is in that digital environment and, 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 and work to do that sort of course correction particularly without having to make mom and dad be the teacher to, to do that course correction? Yeah, we, we put a heavy lift on parents uh, by mid-March this year. And, um, you know, I myself with, with my teammates, they're, they're parents and they're working. And, um, you know, we have someone actually on the, uh, sitting in here today, Amanda Santorbi, who is one of my project team leads. And uh, she's got a preschooler and, and then a um, toddler, I guess you would say she's a, she's in that toddler phase now, but she, um, you know, she was, she was childcare. She was full-time employee. She was teacher. Uh, she was uh, getting them out for their exercise and making sure they weren't, you know, running around the house going crazy. And, and she had a dog. I mean, there was all these, these crazy things happening. And so just living vicariously through my employees, I saw how hard it was. I think one of the things that, that we offer um, in the ed tech space is we have screening available. It's a monthly screener that's very short and it is a differentiated screener which allows the families and the, the educator to see where the student is in relation to their grade level. And because these are short screeners looking at automaticity of skill with regards to, to reading and math, uh, it's a quick indicator of what we need to do to differentiate the instruction. And then the path of instruction uh, at iStation is already built and recommended based on how the student chooses and moves through the program. Um, so one of the things that we'd like to do is take the lift off of the educator and the parent by creating that path. Uh, so in the ed tech space, if you have something that does that, it is 
going to be so much more helpful because it's going to pave the road ahead for you. It's going to help with that roadmap to where the student needs to be. And then also making sure that what you're choosing has a lot of opportunity for all kinds of differentiation, meaning face to face, sitting with your mom or dad or sitting with the, the teacher, doing things that are simplistic, not giving parents um, something to teach. It's a standard that they've never addressed before, making sure that if they have resources to work with their students, that they're simplistic and that they can pretty much be scripted to a point where we can say, hey, parent, this is how you can guide this particular you know, 10 minute lesson. Uh, without feeling like you're having to take on, uh, you know, a PhD and, and learn how to be a teacher and go get that certification because that's, that's just not doable. It's not, it's not scalable for the families. Thank you. That's good. Um, Dr. Tate and Jess, let's bring you back in for a minute to talk about parents are just being bombarded with information from everywhere. Beyond what we've talked about today, um, what other information should parents consider and are there resources you can suggest to them that they can turn to as they make this decision about school and, and the fall? Uh, I'll let Jess go first, but. Okay, okay. Jess, yeah. Uh, there was a, just this today, I was uh, researching to make sure because the CDC guidelines change sometimes quite frequently. And so I just went and typed in uh, in a Google search CDC guidelines to see what came up. Um, and when you do that, there's a section for school programs, and then it comes back. There's a page that talks about for school and, and, and administrators. There's also a section for parents and caregivers. And right there, it says the decision-making tool, which is something you can actually go through. As I click on it right now, it's a little introduction. There's, they give you some decision-making considerations. They talk about COVID a little bit, symptoms in children and adults, um, what, what constitutes increased risk. And then they actually give you a, you know, a household and community risk for COVID, a little questionnaire to go through, um, talk about knowing your school's plan to reduce that risk. And then they actually start with that decision-making tool from back to school. You know, questions, how you feel comfortable. I believe the school has resources. And then it goes to a virtual at home. Is virtual at home and is feasible? And then also goes to academic and social emotional well-being, school-based services. And so it's a great tool for you as parents and I as a parent to use to make that decision. Uh, there's also another section there that is for checklists for families of things to think of as you, if you make that decision to go back to school, things such as being familiar with the COVID testing site if you know your child is exposed while at school, knowing a point of contact, making sure your immunizations are up to date, not only going over hand washing procedures and wearing a mask, but also talking to your kid about not sharing pencils and pens and technology and other things. And, it goes through a lot of things to think about as a parent before you do send your child to school. So I found that to be a really good resource of two different ways, a checklist if you're making that decision, and then once you've made that decision, what to do. And again, just go to CDC on, and Google CDC guidelines, and it's very easy to navigate to. Great. That's a great resource. Jess, do you have thoughts on that topic? Uh, no, I would just um, agree. Dr. Tate and I were speaking before this panel. I have a master's in public health, so I'm always looking to the CDC and then, of course, our local county statistics to understand whether we're increasing or decreasing and what the transmission rate is. I will say for a momentous institute in regards to our decision making for the school, we're following CDC guidelines, and I feel like you can't go wrong following those guidelines. The only caution that I would offer is I have, you know, personally and professionally seen different sources and websites that are trying to get to there's only one correct decision um, and um, communicating in a way that places judgment over parents doing one thing or the other. If you are reading through an article and get that sense or feeling, I, I would discontinue um, reading literature because, you know, Dr. Tate and I are in agreement from a mental health and a medical health perspective. The decision is going to be different for every family. You know your child best. You know your family circumstances the best. Um, and either way, there is a path to risk reduction and mental well-being, um, whether you're sending your child back to school or not. And Lynette, I would also point out, uh, and part of this is like, like my wife and I, that, you know, two, three months ago, we were sending our kids to school. That decision was made. That decision's now changed and reconsidering it. We've got, I think, three days to make that decision. But also, Frisco, and I'm, I don't know about all school districts, 
has given the option that's by grading period. So if you go through one grading period and it just doesn't work for your child, you can switch. So know as a parent that you may, you may make a decision that you feel is best for your child, and it turns out it doesn't work. You can always course correct and make another decision. This, we're all going through something I've never been through in my lifetime. And so it's, there's no magic eight ball that works for this. There's no one right decision. You just make the best decision you can with the information you have. And if it, you have to change or alter course, then change or alter course. I would encourage, obviously, you know the material level of your children. Have conversations, as Jess has pointed to. We had a very frank conversation with my kids last night, and we elicited their input. There's a lot of things going on right now in your children's life that is outside their control, and they handle that in different ways. And so if you can lend them a voice to the conversation, I feel, and I'm not a professional psychiatrist or psychologist, they will have a much better job at handling that if they have a voice and feel heard and feel they have an impact on that decision. That's a great advice, and I appreciate that reminder. As, as Jess mentioned earlier, there's no playbook for, for parents and teachers, and there's no playbook for school districts that are trying to make those decisions. So it is, it is a changing environment. Um, Jess, we have a, a question from a parent that I think maybe is directed to you and Dr. Tate. If you have some thoughts, you can jump in. It says, what are some examples of, way par of ways parents can utilize physical exercise to help alleviate mental stress? while ensuring their safety from COVID. Yeah, and there's, there's a strong correlation. There's a ton of research um, correlating physical health and exercise with mental well-being. And so I strongly encourage parents to find an outlet for their children. And you know what I would say is you have to, the CDC also, there are, are several different tools that assess the risk of different types of sports, whether they're indoor or outdoor and how the play occurs. But even if you take sports out of the picture, um, my son, I'm just offering as a parent, my son loves to ride bikes and I've really um, underscored for them the importance of getting outside or you know ensuring they have activity. And so that's the activity that I do with him. My daughter loves to swim. And so um, I have a pool and I'm getting her in the pool as often as possible. And really when they tend to retreat, I'm pushing them on that, knowing that it's really going to, um, it's really gonna help them in managing their stress and anxiety. So what I would say, it's very similar to reading, encourage your child to do what they love because they're more likely to do it. Um, and then if you can do it with them or have them do it together, it, it, it's going to give them more incentive. So I ride bikes with my son all the time. Um, but I, I do think it's important. And because we really have no end in sight, you know, this is sort of our next normal. Um, it's a good um, habit to build now for our kids. And I would encourage parents to think outside the box. Um, obviously, if you make the choice, for instance, uh, to have your child do virtual. Um, I know my daughter, for instance, and my son are very much extroverts. They love that interaction with people. And so I know if we do make that decision, I'm going to have to think of ways to get some of that interaction that's not over technology. So we've already talked with a number of our kids' friends, parents, and, and made decisions that kids could come to the house and they'll be in separate, you know, I have a walkway in the middle of my yard. One will be in another one yard and one will be in another yard and they can talk. Or we'll put up a, I think it's badminton, I don't know the name where you hit the feather thing over. So they're there's activity and they're seeing each other and there's socialization or, you know, volleyball game, one family over here and another family over here, they're 20 feet apart or whatever, but we're still that interaction. So get, just think outside the box in different ways for that activity and also that interaction that's safe um, and things of that nature, just outside the box, what we got to do during this time. Well, certainly creativity and innovation is the, at the top of what has to happen. Dr. Tate, we have a question for you too about, um, School districts are recommending different uses of masks and face shields, um, recommending that students wear a mask coming into, into the building, but then maybe in the classroom using a face shield. This question is about, um, do you have any thoughts about the effective use of one or the other and how parents can understand and manage that usage? I know for my kids, if that's a decision that comes up, I'm gonna recommend they wear a mask at all times because uh, a face shield alone, for instance, in the hospital, Whenever we're patient facing, patient facing, we wear a mask and protective goggles. And so, for me personally, I don't feel a facial covering is enough. Um, that masks are very important. So I'm going to encourage my kids to wear masks, and I encourage pretty much demand that my kids wear masks 
all the time. And you know, mask is a, a touchy subject with some, and there's concerns that I've heard from a number of families about, I'm not sure my kid's gonna be able to wear that all the time. And Jess already alluded to starting that practice at home, half an hour a day, increasing by an hour a day, until they've made that full eight hours. Let them pick out their mask. If they want a super colorful, you know, for me, if I want an A, my kids want an A&M mask or Baylor or whatever, let them pick out their mask. So it's something that they've had, again, that voice in, and then it makes it more likely they're going to be compliant with that. Thank you. There's a follow-up question for you, too, which is asking about the particular, the, the risk of particular ages of children. Are there, we, we hear difference about younger children, older children. Are there differences in the stance between children that are ages over 10 and 10 and under? Uh, there's not so much the risk that now the symptoms will differ a little bit from zero to nine and 10 to 19. It's more those comorbid conditions, um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, things of that nature. I mean, we're seeing uh, a number of children less than one year of age with COVID. Um, and so it's really those comorbid conditions. But I want to emphasize, even though your child may have no comorbid conditions, doesn't mean that they're, they're, they're immune to this and they're going to be just fine. Children who have no medical problems are getting extremely ill. Um, and again, there's that also that risk of transmitting it to someone in the family who may be high risk. And so, again, I emphasize, look at your family as a unit and assess that risk of that family as one unit. Thank you. So, Lori, you received a question in the chat about iStation working with, uh, with child care facilities, and you answered that, and people can go look at that answer. But that brings a question a little bit about um, addressing the kids that are, are, are preschool, um, maybe that aren't in a, in a registered school environment or in pre-K, that a number of our parents here may have younger children in that use of technology. And what can you share with them about how they can integrate technology in a, in a positive way or maybe even something that's not such a, a good idea? It's a tough one. I think um, what we find is a lot of our community um, get groups will, will sponsor yeah. things. There we um, go. Sorry, we'll, we'll see them sponsoring things in community groups. We've had um, local outreach groups or community groups that have uh, worked and partnered with iStation and other tech companies to provide a facility where students can go in small groups to uh, partake in that kind of a learning environment. Uh, maybe it's a, a boys and girls club or a before and after school program at the local district. So there's lots of different places that we have seen and that have partnered with us in, in the past and currently partnering with us as well. Um, so there's opportunities there. Um, we, we have partnered with local libraries to make it accessible to our families, but we also know that libraries have not been accessible uh, in our current situation, unless they're in a very rural area where there aren't a lot of cases. We've seen a lot of library closures or uh, at least temporary closures. So it's been a challenge uh, for sure. We uh, have worked with a lot of the school districts to find out if they have early childhood programs and if they are already using us or in other ed tech programs, lots of times you can extend that learning into the preschool environment and into the early childhood environment, uh, as long as it's developmentally appropriate and addressing those very early skills, just as just letter recognition and sound simple correspondence and things that we really need to get embedded in that early year. So if, if they are a community partner, have a community facility, um, or maybe doing something in small groups, even micro schools are popping up. And that's where we have a parent in, the, in maybe a neighborhood with an early childhood child, and that parent is the micro school. Maybe there's seven or eight kids that are going there and they're participating in uh, some sort of a, a curriculum that they're using or they're extending off the curriculum they were using at their previous preschool. And they're making these micro school environments where they're very small, and limited and everybody's being extremely safe, social distancing, masks, and that parent becomes the micro school. So we're hearing from our families, a lot of the micro schools are popping up in neighborhoods where parents are taking turns and maybe one's at home on Tuesday, Wednesday, and one's at home on Monday through Friday, Monday through Friday, maybe just Tuesday, Thursday, but they're making do and they're learning new ways in their, in their neighborhoods and in their uh, communities to come together and help support the children in the, in the neighborhoods. Thank you. So Dr. Tate, we have a follow-up question to you that's about face covering and masks. And it's a, the question is about, is there a concern with a long use of a mask? Uh, for example, breathing carbon dioxide that comes in and out. Any kind of issues that parents need to be aware of there? 
Absolutely not at all. For instance, when I go to work, I usually work a, when I'm a, I'm a hospitalist, which means I take care of kids in the hospital. Uh, and so when I go to work, I'm in a mask for 12 to 14 hours throughout the entire day. Um, used to be I would take it off when I was in my office, but now that we're in office with other people, I leave it on all day long. There's no ill effects from that at all. Uh, it's very safe to wear a mask. Um, it's, it's nothing that I would worry about at all. I'm more afraid of people and how they wear it than, you know, below the nose, above the mouth. It's, it's not the mask itself. So you're, you're safe asking that with no carbon dioxide concerns at all. What about the care and, and, you know, of a mask itself? If the child is wearing it all day long at school and their clothes and those kinds of things, what uh, tips can you offer parents about how do they, how do they, care for those items and, and also just make sure that it's um, safe for the rest of their family. Absolutely. And, and the, the main part is how you take on and off the mask. If you just grab it like this, that's not an effective way. I wish I had a mask right in front of me, I would show, but you always take off the ear first and take them off the ears and then lay it down um, and then pick it back up and put one ear on and then adjust. Um, often you'll see people that are you know, walk around picking up pins and then sticking their fingers under their mask or moving their mask or having it, keys have it on um, and not to mess with it at all possible. As far as uh, care for it, obviously, for instance, the masks that we have at the hospital, those are usually disposable, um, but masks from the cloth masks, uh, you can wash in you know, laundry very safely. Um, if you buy a mask, I would follow whatever the instructions on how to properly care for that mask. Um, but if it's a cloth mask, you should go safely wash it uh, if it's not, then I would, you know, if it's one of those disposable masks, just make sure that you're, uh, you know, getting a new mask each day. And their clothes, um, you know, we hear stories on the media about uh, particularly people who work in hospitals and in um, other areas where they're exposed, they, they take their clothes off in the garage and wash them every night. Do you have any advice for parents or uh, about caring for that when and when and if students do go back into on-campus instruction? So that's, that's a good point, um, and, and I laugh about that because I've been doing that since for the longest time since I'm in the hospital and used to be an ICU doc and be around, I'm around a lot of flu and paraflu and all kinds of things. My wife makes me strip down the garage before I'm allowed in the house and there's a bathroom right there and that was happening way before COVID, so kind of chuckle at that. But, you know, and that brings up a good point. Some of our parents don't have a choice about what to do. They both have jobs and they have to work and so the kids have to go to school. And so that's, you bring up a good point about, as, and, and my wife and I have been going through that as we make this decision of, if we do send them to school, okay, dad's high risk, what are we going to do to mitigate my risk to make sure I'm safe? And part of that may be having the kids change their clothes or take a shower um, before they come home. There's a lot of different things you can do to, it's not going to eliminate the risk. There's no, let's be clear, there's nothing we can do to 100% eliminate the risk of catching COVID, but there's things we can do to mitigate and reduce that, um, be that. Uh, you know, like we talked about showering and changing clothes and laundering. You don't need to do special bleach. It's just regular washing your clothes is just fine. Um, but there's different things you can do to mitigate the risk. Thanks. Great. Jess, we have a question for you that came up about since the Momentus Institute also operates a school on a daily basis. Um, many, the question is that many other countries have experienced their first waves of COVID well mm -hmm. in advance of the United States. Have we learned any lessons from what has worked well in those other countries in bringing kids back to school that mm -hmm. on, on campus in person learning? We are tracking um, internationally what um, different countries, how they are bringing students back. But I'll tell you the research that we have been most focused at to think about how to prepare at momentous school and momentous school, we're actually we're coming back August 25th online and we will be online assessing the transmission rate in Dallas County every two weeks to make a decision going forward about then moving into a hybrid approach and then the potential of bringing all students back to campus. Um, but the research that we've mostly focused on have been um, implementation and research that was done with um, childcare programs in New York City um, in um, that, you know, during March, April, May, we're providing um, childcare and there have been several that really got it right. Um, you know, like Dr. Tate said, you know, this is about risk reduction. You cannot eliminate risk, um, but did a really good job as evidenced by having few children that were impacted and there was one program that had no children infected. Um, and so we've looked at what are the implementation strategies they used, whether they're breaking out students 
um, into their own pods. Every student has their own supplies. They cannot share supplies. Using masks, having um, you know dividers in between every pod. Thinking about how to do rotations, how to do specials, bringing lunch and breakfast into the classroom, things of that nature. That's really been up until now um, the implementation and research we focused on the most. And the, those are the guidelines along with CDC guidelines that we're following. Thank you. So this is a little involved question and I'm going to toss it out and in whichever one of you feel like you have the best opportunity to answer this. This question is about um, are there any best practices that you all can recommend parents advocate for at the children's schools? Safety measures that parents ought to be asking for, particularly things like high exposure management, UV, sanitation technologies. Um, this this uh, questioner asks, there's a funny meme going around online that points to cleanliness of bathrooms at schools. The, this parent would love to hear your advice from a public health sort of infectious disease perspective about those kinds of things that parents need to be advocating for. I would yes. really, yeah. and I, I've seen it, we seem to be going back to it. There's a lot to this question. Um, <laughs> wearing the mask is key. You know, I dropped my daughter off at 540 this morning for uh, her first drill team practice. I, I kind of stayed in the parking lot and watched to see how they were going to handle these girls and dancing the routines. And they had clearly lined out 10 feet where they should stand and what they should do and as they practiced and warmed up and things. And so uh, social distancing is the key, um, masks is the key. For having frequent hand washing stations for the children as they walk through, that's one worth they can wash and sanitize their hands. But you know, really it's gonna come down to the school can only do so much. They can definitely uh, scour the bathrooms and different common places, um, lunchrooms and things of that nature. But it's really gonna come a lot to us as parents and what we talk and teach our children about the social distancing. And I completely real and appreciate that that's a different conversation from a you know a four year old versus my 15 year old daughter. Um, and I can I appreciate when my daughter was four, I would have challenges of social distancing. But starting those lessons about you know not hanging on each other, hugging each other, wrestling, high fiving, things of that nature. There's a lot of teaching that we as parents that's going to be more effective in keeping them from getting exposed than really what the school is going to do. And I'm not saying the negating of the school's responsibility keep these building clean for that and that nature, but really the true effect is going to be the mass, the distancing, and how our children, and we teach them how to interact with other children in school. I agree with everything. The only other thing I would add is, you know, at least asking and understanding how rotations are occurring um, and what's going to happen in the lunchroom. Those are just, those are times where there's going to be a higher body count. Um, and so just to understand how the school is thinking about children in the hallway, um, children in the cafeteria, um, you know, are there possibilities of teachers rotating classes instead of students? Um, and then you can decide based on your comfort level, but at least you know what the protocol is. And that brings a good point. You as parents, as you make this decision, don't be afraid to reach out to the school. How is recess going to work? But as Jess alluded to, how is the cafeteria going to work? How is this going to work? I would also recommend, as we talked about resources earlier, talk to your pediatrician. They, in theory, have been seeing your child. They know your child's medical history. And so if you have questions, concern, reach out to them. I'm struggling. Should my kid go to school? This is what I found out from the school. Can you help me with that decision? Also, if your, your child is followed at Children's or Cooks or one of the me children's medical facilities in town, go to their websites. Look at the resources that they have um, because they you know, obviously have been caring for your patients, but sorry, your children. Uh, but really, the pediatricians are great resources you make this decision. But don't gonna... be afraid to advocate for your child and ask the questions to get that information. You, you know your child best, uh, the, the totality of your child, their emotional, physical, and everything about them. If you need information to make decisions, don't be afraid to ask for it. I was just going to add. to offer something? Yes. Yeah, I was just going to add that, you know, not only do we see this when we're working with our educators and all these, these great ideas and suggestions, but one of the things that we do regularly is travel to schools and facilities all over the country to provide professional development in using educational technology. And so I think you know, what we have learned just about putting our own humans in, in these risky situations uh, is what, what are the basic guidelines of the CDC? What is the, the Global Bio Risk Advisory Council saying? So if you've heard of the GBAC or GBAC certifications, these are also great guidelines that talk about 
you know, facilities like convention centers and theaters and large gathering places, uh, and what kind of guidelines must they have? What does it mean between health risk versus sanitization protocols? And so what we've had to do is, is ask our teachers and our schools before we agree to go out now, are these in place? If we're doing multiple sessions, just like students would be rotating in recess, are there cleaning opportunities in between those meeting times? So if we're going all to the cafeteria together like the students would, how are we doing that and are we having time to sanitize in between the, the children coming in and out? Same thing for the recess uh, for the playground equipment. So in the adult world, you know, we're asking those same kinds of questions. Are you going to be cleaning the restrooms while we're there learning together as educators? Are you going to provide sanitization stations that are in close proximity to all of us? Do we have 10 feet for the speaker versus the people so we don't have that spray effect? And are they sitting six feet apart? So there's lots of things to consider in the school environments that affect a lot of things and the teachers as well. Uh, and if we're doing a good job of modeling as the adults, I think our students and our young ones will also pick up on, on those habits. And, and that's the big thing is to be good models for them as well. Thank you, that's great. Jess, we have spent a lot of time talking about parents but as we talked about before, the Momentous Institute also operates a school. And a key part of this whole aspect are the teachers, are the educators themselves. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts and what can you say to parents about how we can support the teachers who are going to be struggling through the, not only the same issue sometimes as parents, but what we, we know they've missed their students. We know that they would rather be in class with their kids. Um, one of the key learnings we, we thought about earlier last week was that, you know, as, as these teachers start this brand new year, they will not have had a relationship with these students like they did before. It wasn't so hard to transition to online learning when they had kids in their classroom and they already knew them. This is a really new environment. What, mm -hmm. what can we do to support the teachers and, and help that transition? Mm -hmm. uh, we just had our teachers return today um, for virtual training and preparation going into the school year and I attended the morning meeting this morning and you know our teachers wanted to know because our principal has been in touch with families and our um, uh, like resource, resource coordinator has been in touch with families first of all our teachers wanted to know how are our families doing how are children doing um, you know what you said is, is true. Teachers have apprehension about starting the year online because that initial period of the school year that is focused on building the relationship and understanding the child helps the teacher with everything they do throughout the whole year. So one thing I can say for parents is to communicate with your child's teacher. Um, both to ask questions and just to engage them in conversations around what is going to support my child having the best outcomes. I heard that from our teachers at the school, at Momentous School, but also from my kids' teachers um, last year. When I asked questions, I was hesitant to ask questions and engage in conversations because I felt like they had so much on them, and yet it gave them more to work with to support Jolie and Marcel, my two children. So that's one thing um, I would say also to offer. I mean, I just feel like everyone in the world right now needs grace and compassion. Um, yeah. Parents need grace and compassion. I know for me as a leader, I think my staff needs grace and compassion. And so um, understand that parent uh, teachers are stressed out about going back into the classroom. Teachers are also stressed out about having to teach online. So whatever way they're plugging in, there's a lot of stress that they're trying to navigate themselves. So I think if you can offer them the same compassion that you would want a teacher to offer you as a parent, that's really important. And then I will say, you know, Momentous Institute, we, um, in addition to having the school and therapy center, we push out content and a significant amount of that is for teachers and parents. So we have um, a variety of resources if you go to momentusinstitute.org um, that you know, um, support teachers and we have webinars for teachers in schools um, and nonprofit organizations, a calendar built out through the end of the year. We also have a blog that really focuses predominantly on parents and the majority of our content over the last four months has either been about how parents um, can support 
their children when it comes to how to discuss the pandemic, also how to discuss um, race and, you know, how, how to, you know, think about engagement um, with their children to open up dialogue around race. Um, but, you know, pointing, pointing either parents to support teachers and letting teachers know that there are resources offered, um, whether it's through Momentous Institute or another provider, and just engaging in that dialogue so that the teacher knows what the student is dealing with um, and can best support them. Thank you. You know, that's a really valid point about the grace and and just the flexibility and fruition. We, we, we know that there is huge frustration from our all our parent friends about the yin yang of going back and forth. We're going to school, we're not going to school. Um, the education leaders that we work with on a regular basis, we know they are trying their very hardest to make those decisions. Your superintendents and your folks that are doing the, the that are, are in the hot seat every day trying to make those decisions. So we would we'd offer that thought too about recognizing that they're doing their very best and the situation keeps changing. Um, Dr. Tate, we have one more technical question and I think we have time to throw in a, a clothing and maybe Jess, you, you can, this one was, was asked about childcare facilities particularly, but I think it's relevant to schools, about asking whether parents should bring extra shoes or so that children can place their shoes sort of at the entrance that, you know, rather than walking around in the building with shoes that they come in from externally, particularly related to sitting on rugs and circle time and activities on the floor. Is there any relevance to that any different than, than your concept of, uh, that, than your answer about dealing with clothes? Uh, that's not something I would recommend. Um, you know, the transmission rate from surface contact is minimal at best. Theoretically, it's possible, um, but it's definitely not the main, mean, main mode or means of uh, transmission. And so it's not something I would worry with bringing a lot of extra clothes or shoes or things of that nature. It's more, again, that mask, that coughing, that, uh, you know, that kind of contact that you're most likely to catch the virus than the surface transmission. Great. So, Laura, you just put some uh, resources in the chat uh, that parents might refer to. Would you like to address that real quickly? Sure. One of the things that, you know, I kind of mentioned early on, we realized immediately the disparity between the types of technology available in the home environment when everybody had to pivot so quickly. Uh, so there's actually a series that was developed. It's a YouTube series right now. It's called the Red Cape Classroom, and it was designed to address the families in the home environment and how they might find balance between technology and interaction in the home environment with just using things around the house. So how might you incorporate a math lesson, incorporate a math lesson or a reading activity that can just use things around your home? And the reason I, it brought, I brought this to mind was because we were talking about grace and patience, and one of the series actually is from a, a parent who works for iStation who did the exact same thing. She was out on a morning walk and she's like, I have got to give myself some grace. I have two young boys in here that I'm trying to teach and, and get their schedule going, get them online and then come offline. And then I'm trying to work at the same time. And the grace and patience is such a huge thing. Uh, so this series really takes that into account and it's speaking to you from a parent perspective and everybody who, um, who did a broadcast and a, and a session was a parent who could really bring in that uh, that perspective. Thank you for offering that. So I think we've uh, addressed all the questions that we had in the chat, but I'll just throw it open one more time to uh, you know Dr. Tate, Lori, and Jess. Is there anything that you thought of that we haven't covered? Anything you'd like to offer to our folks before we move to our closing? Two quick things. One as parents remember to take care of yourself if you're you know if you're depressed or if you're ourself are very anxious or getting sick or ill um, and be sure to take care of yourself because if you're not taking care of yourself you can't take care of your child and so be sure to uh, re look out for services and um, and things that you need as well and also want to make sure those parents who have kids who are in special education programs or 504b who are, or are getting speech or occupational therapy or but or mental health services, anything through the school, I would be prophylactic and reach out to the school now and find out what is the plan if I do go virtual or what's the plan if I'm gonna be at school. Know that plan uh, and then talk through it so you're aware of what's gonna happen. So there's no, I would hate for you to wait until school started and then something happens that you're not aware of and then you're scrambling and instead of knowing what's going on up front with your child because then you can advocate better if you know the information. 
Terrific. Thank you. I, I would just offer something that keeps me grounded and centered in all of this. You know, I think, I know all of us think 2020, what? <laughs> <laughs> Can it go away <laughs> soon enough, right? With more. And it is overwhelming and, um, and challenging. And what I, something that I tell myself regularly, if I don't just, just just as a human being, not just as an executive director, if I don't take this opportunity to grow, I will have likely missed the biggest opportunity of my lifetime. And I feel that way about uh, for us as leaders of organizations, I feel like that for us collectively as a community, it is difficult. We want to honor that it's difficult. And I think we're going to have the best opportunity to innovate coming out of this based on what we're learning. Um, so that's something I will offer to everyone that I ask myself every morning. What can I do to grow and learn from this? And it keeps me centered and not just focusing on this seems like an impossible situation. Terrific. So let me also point you to our friends at Children's Health that support Dr. Tate have uh, put a resource in the chat uh, about some resources at Children's Health that uh, you might want to jump in and, and see. Lori, I almost cut you off. I apologize. Did oh, you I still, you know, I, I was just going to say comment? that it's balance. You know, it's 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 balance. And from a technology perspective, technology is, is the big focus right now, obviously, with remote learning. But there still has to be balance. We can't do everything online. We, we as adults are also Zoom fatigued. And um, so we have to make sure that the, that the schools are offering balance and, uh, and ask your teachers, you know, how is this going to be conducted if we're going remote and uh, what, what, you know, off and on as far as on technology and off are we going to have so that we do still promote that balance. I think it's just really, really important to know that technology is great, but it can't do everything and it really does need to be uh, about the, the ins and outs of the teacher and the student and the technology. Perfect. Thank you. So please, um, our sincere thanks to Dr. Brad Tate, to Jessica Trudeau, and to Lori Lynch. Will you guys join me in our virtual clapping to thank them mm -hmm. for this, uh, this, this great session? I'd like now to uh, bring into the conversation Drexel Owusu, who is our, our Dallas Regional Chamber Senior Vice President for Education and Workforce. He has a couple quick thoughts and some closing. Drex? Thanks, Lynette, and thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you to Dr. Tate and Jessica and, and Lori for, for your great thoughts and insights and perspectives on an issue that I think is near and dear to, to all of us. Um, as a parent, you know, I found this incredibly informative and helpful in helping me think through and frame some of these, these big issues, uh, and, and we really appreciate you giving us a little structure to do that. Um, tomorrow we'll be doing uh, uh, the same thing again um, uh, in terms of talking about these issues as it relates to secondary uh, through college age students um, with a different group, of, different panel. But um, if, if you're interested, I, I know we dropped this in the chat. I'm sure we can drop it again. Uh, or you can visit uh, DallasChamber.org uh, and check out our events to, uh, to, to register for tomorrow's uh, webinar as well. Um, I'll, we'll also point you to a number of resources that we have on the future of work and, and, and business uh, on our website at dallaschamber.org again, uh, including key takeaways and some best practices around reopenings. Uh, you'll also find a, a list of uh, school plans for both Dallas area public and private schools. Uh, and then last but not least, I'll share a slide here. Um, we have uh, two uh, important educational workforce events coming up. Both will be virtual. Uh, on August 13th, we will host our annual State of Higher Education luncheon, uh, except for there won't be lunch, uh, uh, at noon, presented by our friends at Thomson Reuters. Uh, and we're excited to have Dr. Harrison Keller, uh, who's the Commissioner of Higher Education for the state of Texas as our keynote speaker to talk about post-secondary workforce development, as well as how colleges and universities are dealing with the COVID crisis. Uh, registration is now open, so please again visit dallaschamber.org. Uh, and of course, we welcome any and all people who are interested in sponsoring that. Uh, and then on September the 18th, uh, we will also, uh, at, at noon, we will host uh, our 2020 State of Public Education, uh, featuring Texas Commissioner of, uh, of Education, Mike Morath, 
Uh, this will be presented by Toyota, and uh, based on today's discussion, I don't think there's probably a more uh, relevant or interesting uh, man to hear speak than the, the, the guy responsible for education in our state of Texas. Uh, thank you again to all of you for joining us today. Uh, we uh, encourage you again to join us tomorrow for the secondary group. Uh, and with that, we will give you some time back in your day. Thanks again. Thanks.